Hey everybody, welcome to Bones Collector, where today, on this video, we're going to talk about our top 10 2021 games. Yes, I know it's April. <laughs> it took me a long time to put together any kind of list from 2021. I struggled to find games I could recommend heartily to you that wouldn't be a waste of your money. I, I have to admit that. I didn't think there was it was that good of a year in 2021. The ones that I'm going to show you are amazing, but there wasn't a lot to pick from. I played a lot, a lot of games, and I watched a lot of games played, and I just couldn't recommend them or, or couldn't tell you in good conscience to go out and spend your hard-earned cash on those games. So enough about that. I do want to cover a couple of topics real quick before I start my list. And the first thing I want to talk about is this game again. And you, I did a video on this game, Merchants of the Dark Road. I wanted to give it another shout out for being a wonderful, fun, amazingly produced game. Merchants of the Dark Road, it is such a good game. I have only played it two player, however. And the thing in this game that I want to talk about is the rondelle. When you use the rondelle in this game, you have a choice of going to two different locations for every spot on the rondelle. So you have to make that tough choice right then of which space you're going to. And then the dice bumping mechanic on your player board is phenomenal. And then the production this game is off the charts. And when you get this game, and I did, it is pricey. I paid $140 for this copy of the game. It's, that's a lot of money. But if you go out and get this game, make sure, I mean, I don't know if you have to make sure, but the, one of the things I love the most about this game, the production of the game, are these silk-lined velvet money purses with the silver-tipped strings on them that match your player board, and then the money itself, the metal money in this game, is the best in board gaming that I've ever seen. And that really adds to the immersive experience of this game. And you're saying, why do you want to give it another shout-out? Because I, there has been some lukewarm reviews of this game from big-time reviewers, and that would work in your favor <laughs> because I think people will try to dump this game, maybe try to get rid of it quickly without even playing it if they listen to some of these people. And that might be a great opportunity for you to go out and get it at a cheaper price. So if you're looking for this game, if you want a fun, immersive experience in board gaming, wow. This is off the charts. It's easily my top game so far for 2022, which I'll be doing, yeah, whenever, next year. And But I wanted to talk about it again. Yeah, it's Merchants of the Dark Road. It's wonderful. The designer is uh, Brian Schur. I was sure. I don't know how you say his last name. Brian, thank you for an excellent board game. I love this thing. I can't wait to play it again. Okay, so that's my first subject today. My second subject today is I watched a review of this game over in the Dice Tower, and they gave this game the Seal of Excellence, and I thought, well, I want to play that. Because I really want to get games sometimes that my grandkids would be interested in playing that I think would hold their interest they like the monsters and, and being scared and battling, that kind of thing. And so I thought I'd pick this up, and so I did. I went out and got a copy of it. I paid $54 for it. It wasn't cheap, but I thought I'd give it a try. And, oh, man, I cannot recommend this game. But this game, I can say without reservation, it has a nice, sturdy box. And the storage solution in this box is pretty cool. It holds everything wonderfully. But the game, mm, man, I, I just... Didn't have a good time playing that, so there you go. All right, so the third thing I want to talk about is for you Euro gamers out there that are like me and love Castles of Burgundy, there's going to be a deluxe edition reprint coming up on GameFound, and I wanted to make you aware of that. It's coming up in May, and I always, even though I'm in love with Castles of Burgundy, I mean, I adore that game. It's, let's see, I Carpe Diem, then it goes... I forget what number two is. Castle Burgundy? No, I think Carpe Diem, Wingspan, and then Castle Burgundy made my number three of all time. I mean, you can make an argument for being the best board game that you've ever played. It's so amazing. And I always complain about the production of it. And it just held that game back from being as magnificent as it, as it deserves. You know, the, the magnificent opinions that it deserves from other people. But yeah, a deluxe 
edition is coming out on GameFound. You'll have to get on there and request your copy if you want to do that. I want to tell you all about that. I'm super excited about that because Castles of Burgundy, Ticket to Ride, Pandemic, I think of Game of the Century it would be a three horse race right there. And those games are so wonderful that when you can get a deluxe edition of them, it's worth the effort. So yeah, okay, that's enough of that. Let's go to top 10 games of 2021. And the first game, <laughs> I'm telling you, I had a tough time finding 10 games. So I'm going to do talk about some reprints. And it's just because they're wonderful reprint editions and be, they're wonderful games. And I just think they were better than anything that was made this year. So anyway, let's start with this one. Chai by Dan and Connie Kazmaier. This was a Kickstarter, which I don't recommend <laughs> to you guys. We took a chance and, and I'm really running from Kickstarter right now. There's so many bad things going on right now. People losing hundreds and hundreds of dollars on there. Be very careful when you back a Kickstarter project. Make sure it's a reputable production company and that means they've done other games and, and fulfilled them on Kickstarter and or a reputable big name designer. You know, Stefan Feld, Uwe Rosenberg, those kinds of guys. You can pretty much assure yourself that those are going to fulfill. But yeah, we backed this on Kickstarter. My wife loved it. It was, it was her. To, yeah, it was her. It was all her and because uh, I don't think I would have done it but I'm glad she did. And the Kickstarter was kind of run a little shakily. They did not communicate well with the public on how things were going because it delivered late. But it delivered. You know, and when it got here, by the time it got here, because of the lack of communication, the way it was run, I was a little bit upset about, and I was like, you know, what well, if that game ain't amazing, I'm gonna get rid of it. Just because I'm mad. And you know, we played it, and I don't worry. Okay, I had a good time playing Chai. And uh, I really had a good time. I liked it a lot. And I want to tell you about a little bit about this game. It's my number 10 game. And it plays 1 to 5. It says in 20 to 60 minutes. Right in our time frame where we like to play. And inside there's also an expansion called High T. And that did come out in 2021. So there you go. It does have a 2021 flavor to it. But man, first of all, wow. Heavy duty box. Linen finish. This box is so nice. It is, it's a beautiful box. You know what I mean? Hey, if you got a good board game, you want to have a good box around it, take care of it. Rule book, and then inside is some just gamey goodness, man. I'm telling you. You get these terracotta cups to complete your teas in, and, and some beautiful tiles. The tile selection mechanism is really cool on this board, and you have the cost across the top of the board, and the tiles lay in this double layered player board, and if they're light tiles touching, you can select those and pay. For instance, if there was three light tiles in this $2 column, you could take all three of them. That's pretty cool. Or if they were lined up beside each other, if there was a, one, a, a light tile in one and two, you could take both of those for $3. $2? Oh, you could take both of them for $2. I just, my editor just corrected me. Thanks, thanks sweetie. <laughs> So, so that's pretty cool. It's got a pretty cool uh, selection mechanism going on for the tees, and I really like that. <laughs> let me, let me. I, I'm sorry it takes so long. I want to show you some of the components of the game. Oh. Wow, those are so sweet. They're acrylic, clear with screen printed items on them. Oh, I mean, just so beautiful. Beautiful pouch that they come in. And then the market tiles look like, they're kind of like the square Azul tiles from the original Azul. But those are your tees that you can select from the market. So sweet. Yeah, just really nice, beautiful things. And they look great on the table. Right, Nina? And let's see what else we got here. This insert where you have everything goes nice tucked away neatly in here and this is the high T expansion and in the high T expansion you got a uh, one or two dice your choice that you can roll before your turn and it re will restrict what you take from the pantry or the market whatever shows up on the dice you can't take those items we use them because I really liked uh, adding that to the game I thought it worked well and it didn't uh, mess with the game at all it worked very smoothly and then 
You have special ability cards you can select during your turn and then your customer cards when you're trying to make the tees. So uh, a really cool production. And then I thought the coins were, you know, sometimes games have metal money. It's not too impressive, but I mean, wow, check those babies out. They got a $3 gold token. Man, that thing is nice. These, this is nice money. It's not as unique as Merchants of the Dark Road, but it is very cool, and it has tea, tea leaves on the one side. Uh, there's a cup of hot tea on the back of a $3 one. That is so cool. I mean, just, yeah, the amazing production this game helps it. And when we played it, I said, that yeah, okay, I had a good time. We're keeping it. So, yeah, Chai is my number 10 game from 2021. It is a reprint, but I don't care. It works really, really well, and we really like playing it, so we're keeping it. And I want to tell you about it and put it in on my list because, again, it's a good time, and if you haven't checked it out, I mean, even the retail version, I mean, I would play the heck out of it. So, and here's the our little storage solution tray that comes came with ours. And again, this is the Kickstarter edition. It has a metal, a big metal token for first player. That's pretty cool. And, uh, and then there's the, the two dice. You got some clear dice for the high T expansion, the acrylic dice, screen printed. And then these two dice are for the solo variant because this game does play solo if you wish. That goes there. And co-op. And co-op. Yes, this game does have a co-op rule set to it. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I want to show you that. That's Chai T. It's a fun game. I had a good time playing it. I mean, it's contract fulfillment. It's not going to amaze you about any of the mechanics. You've seen them before, but the package, all inclusive like this, it's a good experience. It's a fun board gaming experience, and that's why I play board games to have a great time. That's Chai Tea. All right. Number nine is another reprint, folks, and it's Ginkopolis by Javier Georges. And Javier Georges, he's one of the designers of Twa, I believe. I think he was a co-designer on Twa. And I've played other games of his, and I'm going to say that Royal Palace was by him, and I'm going to say that, what's the one with this floating space dirigible? Oh, Selenia. Selenia. And I really liked Selenia. You know, um, uh, it's not my library anymore, but I really liked that game. But yeah, same designer. Ginkopolis came out in 2012, and we played at a convention and fell in love with it like that. I mean, it was that dramatic, that decisive. We, as soon as we played it, we said, you know what? We we're going to get that game. Well, no way. You couldn't find it. And you could find somebody selling a copy, but it was, you know, $100. I'm going to pay $100 for something you paid $39.95 for. I'm just not going to do that. But they did a reprint. This is by Pearl Games. And it's a wonderful reprint. And this came out in 2021. If you haven't played Ginkopolis, it's in my t ultimate top 100 of all time. It's a wonderful area influence game where you use card mechanics and engine builder. Just got a lot going on in this game. This is not... It's not light, light like chai tea or something like that. This is a little heavier than that, but still a great time. Once you figure out the rule set, you'll enjoy it and you'll play it the rest of your life. That's Ginkopolis by Javier Georges, and that's number nine. All right, then I want to talk about oh, another reprint. <laughs> and I never did play this game, Iki. I, this game, I, I never even heard of it until the reprint. And that can happen. I mean, there's so many board games out there. So games can get by you. This game came out originally in 2015. And I don't know if it just was a small print run or what, but it was hard to find. And I just never came across it. Didn't even see anybody playing it. I never had any kind of exposure to the game until I read about this reprint. And then when I read about it and I checked into it, it looked like something I would absolutely love. And guess what? I did. And it's an amazing production. It is beautiful. Okay, so... Iki is like a philosophical thing, and the one with the most Iki in the game, at the end of the game, wins. Okay, I can't remember the name of these guys, so I'm going to take the lid off of here and look at the rule book, just so I can show you the game a little bit and get the terminology correct. But in this game, you have three sizes of meeples. You have an Oyakata meeple, you have an Ikizama meeple and a, and a Kobun meeple. And they all do different things and have different functions. But they're beautiful meeples and they're screen printed. 
and this game is nicely produced. And you have wooden resources that we have in these little cups and thick tiles, nice thick cardboard money, and these are some of the meeples. This is the yellow and purple because they don't have green for Lori. So um, yellow doesn't show the screen printing real well, but the purple does. So I'll show you a couple of those. Okay, so let's see. There we go, and there's the three different sizes of meeples you're going to use in this game. And they're th very thick, screen printed meeples, very lovely on the board. And then, you know, I mean, that's fun. And, you know, once you make a lap around the board, every time you make a complete lap around the market, you know, you've gone stall to stall, uh, you get to move your guys up one space on the cards and get closer to taking those into your tableau and, and getting their benefits. So that's pretty sweet. We've, we've sleeved all the beautiful, the artwork is absolutely marvelous. The board is beautiful. This is a wonderful Euro style game that I would recommend to anybody and everyone. And just for me, came out last year in 2021 because I didn't even know it existed until I saw that this was going to be reprinted. So that's Iki, designer is Kuda Yamada. And the art is by David Sitbon. So David Sitbon did a nice job in the art. But yeah, Kuda Yamada, and I'm not too familiar with that person, which is rare. I usually know board game designers and follow them around. You know, if they make a good game, I usually check out all their games, but I don't know this person very well. But yeah, it, this I can highly recommend this game, you guys. It's an absolutely phenomenal game, Iki. A game of Edo artisans. It's about, about the city of Tokyo in the 1600s. So yeah, I guess it was called Edo. Yeah. Okay, and the next game is a reprint, sort of, and it is Ticket to Ride Europe 15th Anniversary Edition by Days of Wonder. And Alvin R. Moon is the designer of Ticket to Ride, which has sold hundreds of thousands of copies. Again, easily one of the best games that, or most popular games of this century. So far, so far. I mean, we're the century's young. But this is a phenomenal game. People have loved Ticket to Ride and played it and played it and enjoy it tremendously. Ticket to Ride Europe, let's see, Ticket to Ride came out in 2004. Ticket to Ride Europe came out in 2005 and added train stations, tunnels, and ferries to the game, which I loved all three of the editions personally because you, can, you don't have to use your train stations. You can save them up and get four points for each at the end of the game. It's not like you have to use them, but it might bail you out if someone goes to block you. So that's kind of nice. But you're, you're still torn between play them, save them. Play them, should I save them? Because at the end of the game, you may need those 12 points. And that's a lot of points in this game, 12. So yeah, you want to use them if you have to or if you need to. And then the ferries, of course, you have to use locomotives to complete the routes that have ferries. And the um, tunnels. The tunnels, you have to play cards. Oh, you have to draw cards off the deck three cards off the deck, and if any of those match the color of the tunnel that you're completing, you have to pay another card of that color. So there's kind of a push your luck element to that new addition to the game from the original. But that made the game enough for Lori and I to get a copy, and I'm gonna tell you about it right now. Hey everybody, I wanna take a minute and talk about this Ticket to Ride Europe 15th year anniversary edition. I really, really love this game. But I want to talk a little bit about this particular edition and why it's so fantastic. We just got this game probably a month or month and a half ago. We've played it at five and we've played it at two and I liked it at both those player accounts. It's just a lot of fun. They went to so much detail in the production of this game that I want to talk a little bit about that right off the bat. Now, first of all, the box is a little bit big and the board is a little bit big. But it's okay because there's no player boards, so you don't really need a, uh, that much table space other than what you need to lay out cards. But I want to show you what they did in this box to make this game so accessible for everyone. That's the rule book. And then you, all your trains come in these tin cans and they go in this insert right here. You've got your markers for the scoring track, the cards, and the board lays on top, and that's it. You can set this game up and have it ready to go in two minutes flat, and I love that. I mean, how can you not like that? You simply have any players that are in the game pick their color of tin, they take their tin out of the 
out of this insert, set it in front of them, lay out the board, lay out the cards, put the markers on the scoring track, you're playing Ticket to Ride. I mean, that's simple and that quick, and I really, really love that. Everything in its place in here, it's so wonderful when, when uh, board games do that. Now, the base game of Ticket to Ride, we thought was kind of simple when we first got it years and years ago, and we moved that game on, and there really wasn't a version that was that attractive to us until now. And I saw this online, took a look at it and the production of it, and I just fell in love with it. Every one of the different color trains is a different kind of train car. These blue ones have two Jeeps on them. Uh, this is a tanker car for the pink player. Uh, the brown player is uh, train cars are logs and so forth. So every one of those is different. And then your player marker is also detailed to match your train car in some way so that you know that that is the trains that you're using. And that is so cool that they went to that effort in this game. The cards are all linen finished cards and they say Ticket to Ride Europe 15th anniversary on the back and on the front every color of card is a different train car and that's pretty cool too. So I, I really really like that. They just went to so much effort in this game and the board is absolutely gorgeous. It has some wonderful art on it in the city, some beautiful buildings in the water areas of the board there's ships different types of ships there's a dirigible up in the one corner and and up in uh, siberia there's some cold looking art up there so i love all of that the scoring track itself is beautiful around the edge of the board your tickets that you're trying to complete your route you're trying to complete are just beautiful so everything about this game is just wonderful so i can highly recommend this game to experienced gamers and to novices alike and those are the games that really grow the board gaming hobby games like this we really really didn't you know we just never had a ticket to ride in our library just because we didn't care for the base game uh, it was it was a good game just was a little bit light at the time for us so when this one came out we took a look at it and this one has some things that are not in the first edition of course or the base game of Ticket to Ride. It has the little stations that you can put out on the board to uh, help you complete a route that someone's blocked. So those are kind of nice. And then on the board itself it has ferry routes and tunnel routes that have specific rules to the way you have to complete them. So those additions to the base game and then just the production of this game that makes it so immersive and so wonderful. I'm just, I can highly recommend this game. It's a 2021 print. I mean the Ticket to Ride Europe came out years ago, but this is a special edition. It just came out 2021. That's it, why it's in my top 10 of 2021. And I want to tell you about it and rave about it because this is the type of game that makes board gaming fun. You'll play this game the rest of your life. We plan on playing it the rest of our lives and I wanted to tell you about it. Okay, now we're back and we're gonna continue our countdown number six. This is actually a 2021 game and it's called The Whatnot Cabinet by Steve Finn, Beth Sobel and Eduardo Baroff. Dr. Steve Finn, uh, if you're familiar with his games, he has done Biblios and Institute of Magical Arts and Capo to Copy. The only one in my library currently right now is Biblios, which is so elegant and so wonderful. It's in my ultimate uh, top 100 for sure and, and will remain there. And the Whatnot Cabinet is just a fun little tile laying game. Yay! There's the back of the box. Uh, there's so much to love about this game. I love it. It's a little box, a little game. It's uh, Pencil First Games was a production company. It has that turn mechanism where you're going to take your turn, and when you are done with your turn, you can select where to put your turn guy, your turn marker. And Wherever you put it, if you want to go earlier in the round, you get less benefit. Later in the round you go, you get more benefits. It's a, yeah, and again, you've probably seen that before in other games, but it works well here. And then you have your little whatnot cabinet where you're going to lay your tiles. And your tiles have certain ways that you have to put them down to complete them. And there are crowns on some of the tiles that give you extra bonus points and color combinations that you have to put together. Public goal cards, private goal cards, and the game works. 
folks. It works and it's a lot of fun. Again, I would highly recommend that you try this game, especially if you're like me and my wife Lori, and we like to play games like this that make you think pretty hard in 30 minutes. And, and that's pretty nice. Whatnot Cabinet does that. Again, you got gold cards, and here's the rest of the insert, and there's your turn markers, and uh, you once you complete, when you on your Whatnot Cabinet, once you complete like a row or a column, you're going to score it and put these these point tokens down on the side or the bottom. And it depends on how you've laid those tiles. It depends on how many points you're going to st score. So it's it's a really really good game. I don't hear anybody. I don't know if I've heard anybody talking about it, but I always check out good board game designers. And Steve Finn is a good board game designer. And I, again, Biblios is phenomenal, and this game is wonderful, and it's in my library, and I look for, God, these little puzzle games like this are just, they're just the type of thing we love to play, because you can get it out and play it and be done and have it back in the box, you know, in, probably this game, probably in 30 minutes. We like to keep it at 60 minutes or less, and this game fits that bill. I love it. The Whatnot Cabinet. And that is number six. All right, number five. From 2021, another original 2021 title, Fairy Tale Inn. And this is designed by Paolo Mori and Remo Conzadori. Yeah, a pretty cool cover, huh? <laughs> and this game, uh, you know, I had looked at it and I had to ask myself, you know, I mean, I was intrigued by it because it uses the Connect 4 rack. If you've played Connect 4, that's the back of the box, you can see what's going on there. If you've played Connect 4, it's the same rack. And uh, ex except it has some bonus places on it that are, don't exist in Connect 4. And you're using tiles. And that is, I mean, it's a clever little game design. Yeah, this is a two player only game. I should have said that off the top. Two player only, eight and up, 15 to 20 minutes. I like that. I mean, I love that. And uh, yeah. It's so cool. I, I always say I'm not going to make the video longer and take the lids off of board games, but I'm doing it anyway. Okay, here we, I do that every time. There we go. And then your Connect 4 rack is right like that. You have a bag full of tiles. So you have, oh, excuse me. So your old tiles fit down in the insert right there. And here's how this game works. You have a bunch of character cards that come with the game. I think 12 of them. And you, no, eight. It comes with eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It comes with eight character cards. You're only going to use five in the game. Each character has a different function of the way you're going to score when you place that tile in the Connect Four rack. Okay? So, Little Red Riding Hood, for instance, you gain a dollar for each of your characters next to Little Red Riding Hood, above, beside, and below. Now, Pinocchio works exactly the opposite. You gain a dollar for every one of your opponent's tiles that are around Pinocchio. So that kind of thing goes on in this game. And it's so much fun, and it's very thinky. Because once you're placing your tiles in this rack, uh, the tiles on one side have a picture of the character, and on the other side is a silhouette of the character, so that you know who's played these. So if it's facing you, obviously you've played the tile. If the silhouette is facing you, your opponent played that tile. Just to show you how this works, when you place a tile in this rack, you can see these yellow icons on the rack, and they mean, mean different things. If you were to put a tile in this row and end up with your tile by that star, uh, behind that star, then you'd pay. You could pay a dollar and take another turn. And that man, I tell you, that is huge when you can take two turns in a row in this game. So you are fighting for those spaces, and you're trying to not put. If you if you place the tile there, your opponent's going to take that space for sure and get that opportunity to uh, pay a dollar and take an extra turn if they have a dollar. Because money gets pretty tight in this game, and it's. Pr uh, I mean, those are points. The person with the most money at the end of the game. But during the game, only some of these tiles score during the game where you get dollars so that you can take extra turns. But some of most, well, not most, but some of them score at the end of the game. So there's a nice balance there where you're trying to 
get dollars during the game, but also score big for the end of the game. And then where you see the crowns, if you place a tile behind you and your tile is behind this crown, you get a dollar. If it's behind this double crown, you get two bucks. If you place a tile behind this X, your, tile, your tile's power is nullified. So a really interesting thinky little puzzle that someone cleverly took the Connect 4 rack and made a really good game. So that's pretty doggone neat. And we were excited once we got it and tried it, and now we really, really like it. So yeah, I can really, again, highly recommend this game to you. It's 2021, and it's one of those games. Again, you can play it in 20 minutes to a half an hour, have it put away, having had a wonderful time, laughed a lot, and thought a lot, and that's so cool. And I think the rest of this goes on top, maybe. Everything goes in there, blah, 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 blah. Dude, look how cool that goes in the box. No. It's by S Come On Games, is that how we say it? Come On Now or Simon? We either say Simon or Come On Games. Two player only, fairy tale in, a fun game. It could use maybe a couple more character cards. I mean, as often as we play it, we're fine with the eight, eight or what did I say? Eight. The eight character cards that come with it. But it would, I think oh, some other people might want, and I've read that, oh, we need more character cards. Well, you know, I don't know about. Come on, games is usually those mini game. They they really promote those, and I don't, hopefully this one uh, they give a little bit of attention to, give us a few more character cards. That'd be kind of nice. But hey, if you just want to buy this game, play it like this. It's wonderful. I love it. Fairy Tale Inn. All right. And number four. Number four is going to be a game called Winter Queen. Winter Queen is a game by Yuri Zurovlev. And I, it, that's a hard name to say, and I have to say it all the time because Yuri also designed a game called Viceroy. It's in my top 20 all time, I believe. I mean, I love playing Viceroy. I love it. And so as soon as I heard that he had another game, it's like I tell you guys, when you find a game that you're in love with and you love the way it works, if that guy comes out with another game, it's worth just taking a look at it. So I watched it played uh, and, uh, online, and then we went to a convention and played the game, and we really, really liked it. And it's just an excellent abstract strategy game, a puzzle game, and it, it plays two to four players, ten and up, in 20 to 30 minutes. I love that. For a two-player game, you have three gem holders, and you have four gems on each tile, or three? Four. Four gems on each tile, and you take gems from those holder tiles, like little outlying stations, and you're going to place them on the main board in patterns that you're trying to build according to what spell books you have. So you, when you place one on the board, in that re, uh, whatever region that you happen to be in, you can take a spell book from that region. That, that spell book will tell you what patterns you're trying to build in order to cast that spell. And you have to have the gems on that spell book in order to cast it. So it's quite the puzzle. And, uh, and b before I go on any further, that's one of the most beautiful uh, drawings on the cover of a board game box I've ever seen. The Winter Queen. She's gorgeous. Yeah. And a nice box. There's rule book, and I tell you, the storage solution is magnificent. You get these player aid cards that are absolutely phenomenal, helping you figure out what you're doing as far as pattern building, scoring, and game setup. This is the main board, fits right on top of there. These are your spell books that fit in there. Hopefully, this is all coming. I got that till far enough, I think. And these are the holder tiles, and then you have these gem tiles that go on the board randomly. Some of them have gems on them, some of them are blanks. So if you buy this game and you're punching this game out, some of these tokens are blank. Some of them have gems like that. Some of them are blank. Those aren't, you know how some board games have blanks and you just throw them away? You use these, so don't throw those away if you get this game. Just wanted to point that out. And then the person with the most gold at the end of the game wins the game. Once the bag of gems, oh yeah, I'll show you the gems. Because that's, the, oh, they're there. Those beautiful chunky gems. When, when you're playing the game, the person that takes the last gem off a holder tile, first of all, gets a dollar. So that's a big deal because it can win you the game. In this game, you're not gonna, you're not gonna. It's not a game of riches. It's a tight, tightly uh, contested game. 
and once the bag is empty, everybody takes a, uh, one more turn and the game's over with. So you have to kind of, when you're, when you empty one of the holder tiles and you take your dollar and then you have to put gems, but refill the holder tile from the bag, you kind of feel around in there, see how many gems are left, because the end of the game is going to be triggered when those, that bag is empty. Now you can prolong the game by doing double spell books, and your spell books come with two sides, and if you do both sides, you can put a gem, one of those gems, back in the bag, which will prolong the game. And so I, I try to do that as much as possible. But when you're playing this game, the, the crazy thing is you're building those patterns out here, and if somebody completes a spell book, a double spell book, they're gonna like take the gem out of your pattern. That drives you crazy because you try not to wince in pain. You're trying to not let them know what you're doing, so you just sit there and inside you're crying, but you just have that poker face on and then, uh, yeah, I'll move on. I'll get. So it's a timing thing too because you, you know, do you wait? Because if I, if I put one more gem in that row and it scores, the whole row scores for every different color gem in that row. I can get five points, I can get four points right now, or do I wait and risk, push my luck, that someone won't take that gem off the board and make it worse? Should I score it right now, score that spell book right now? So it's a timing thing also when you're playing this game. I love the game. It's inexpensive, that's a plus, and the game is a really crunchy puzzle, and nobody talks about it, but I do because I love Viceroy, and this guy, is an amazing board game designer because of Viceroy. I love that game. It's in my, again, top 20 all-time games. And I wanted to check this game out. And I played it at a convention, and I liked it immediately. And hey, guess what? It's in my library. And I can highly recommend this game. Winter Queen by Yuri Zurilev. There, Yuri. I hope I said your name correctly. OK, number three, 2021, is Unicorn Fever. And this is a game designed by Lorenzo Silva and Lorenzo Tucci Sorrentino, and it is, I know what you're saying, that is a reskin, and it is. The original game was Horse Fever from early part of the century, 2005, 2009, I don't know when it came out, but they reskinned it with unicorns, and uh, I'm glad they did, folks, because it is a fun, fun time. If you like games like Home Stretch, Camel Up, you're gonna love Unicorn Fever. It's a little deeper than Camel Up. You know, Camel Up's got that great stacking mechanism, so that just keeps that game my ultimate top 100 forever because that was brilliant, this brilliant idea. And in Unicorn Fever, you have a lot more ways to affect the race. It uses a deck of cards. Hopefully you can see this. It uses a deck of cards, and that's going to, up here in the corner, and you turn over one card, and that's going to tell you how many spaces those unicorns are going to move. So that's the movement mechanism for the unicorns themselves. And then you can acquire some shady characters that you can play that are going to affect the races also or give you some benefits and bonuses. Okay. It's an action selection mechanism in this game. You have these tiles laying on the board and you're going to take that tile if you're going to take that action. So that if, you, if your opponent is going to bet on a certain color of horse, you got some magic cards. You, know, if they're going to bet on red, the red horse. If they're going to bet on the red unicorn, then you're going to play magic cards that say maybe things like, next time this horse sprints, it does not sprint. Things like that. So when you roll the sprint dice, if it comes up with a red horse, you're like, yeah, because I play that magic card that says the red horse doesn't sprint. So you can affect the game, the race like that, and it's really, really so much fun uh, we enjoy it and I mean even at two-player Lori and I play it and we're just cheering on our unicorns trying to impose our will and our best wishes on the best unicorns and they're adorable unicorns and they race up the rainbow racetrack I mean I really I played this game and again at the convention and I saw it in the board game library and I said that looks like a goofy game let's give it a shot I didn't know it was a reskinning we played the game and I enjoyed the heck out of it and then found out later it was a reskin of horse fever and I didn't care. I said, you know what? And after we were home from the convention, I thought and thought about it and then finally we picked up a copy. And this game plays two to six players. And if you have more players, of course there's more people cheering as 
it's even more fun, but we, we do enjoy it at two players. It says 40 minutes, and that's about right, and it's a beautiful, fun game. I think it's a little bit heavier than a family game. If you are going to play this with kids that don't play board games, it's going to take some explaining because there's some things going on in this game. So even though it's got the goofy cover and, and the, the goofy unicorn look to it, it's still a little bit going on in this game. So check it out. Maybe watch a playthrough or something online before you make your purchase. But it's a fun time if you like racing games. Unicorn Fever is a 2020 game. It delivered late. And so I didn't know about it or didn't see it until 21. So that's why I put it on this list. For me, it's a new game. I don't think, I think it was a Kickstarter. And again, it delivered very late in 20. So hey, in my book, yeah, that's too, you know, you're late, so we're going to push it over into 21. On Board Game Geek, it says 2020. But we, we, we played it in 2021, and we enjoyed it. So, yeah, Unicorn Fever. And now to number two. Monasterium by Arv D. Fueler. And Monasterium is a game that plays two to four players. It says 90 minutes. We play this in an hour, or I wouldn't have it. And 12 and up. And this game came out in 2020 also in Europe. I don't think it was in the United States until 2021. I mean, I tried to find it because I was intrigued by it. I watched it on YouTube and watched some people talk about it over in Europe. And I told Lori, we're going to have to check that game out. I, mean, I really want it. And so she was able to find it. Where did you find that? Board Game Bliss out of Canada. Oh, yeah. Board Game Bliss out of Canada very early in 21 and we played it and I was so glad we, we got this game. It's absolutely outstanding and you're competing for area influence in diff different monasteries. I think there's one, two, three, four, five different monasteries on the board where you're trying to get influence and you do it through dice drafting and that's pretty cool. Each player is going to roll dice and you have community dice and you have your own one color die and you roll those die and you can select which ones you want to put in the draft pool and that's pretty sweet because then you because you you know what you need you know in the game when you play it you know what you need so if you need threes then when you roll your dice and you have all fives and ones and maybe just one three come up you might want to say to yourself you know what I'll put the one one I rolled out there because I need threes. And I'll re-roll on my next turn those dice and hopefully I'll get more threes. So it's that, that mechanic where you're trying to decide to which dice do I want to put in the drafting pool. And I, 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 don't, I can't have to think about other games that do that. I, off the top of my head, I can't think of it. On your player board, you have a bunch of novices, 24 novices on your player board. Each one of them, when you play them out into a monastery, Get, opens up a benefit to you when you play that die value at the top of your player board. You're making decisions as to what novices you want to take off your player board and, and place in monasteries and get that area influence and then because you want that benefit. And so those decisions go hand in hand with, with your dice drafting. The only thing is, and the only thing about this game that can be a problem is I bump my player board one time with my elbow and I mean those novices went and I, you'd have, you're going to have to remember where they were. There's 24 of them. This game badly needs an acrylic overlay that goes over top of the player board so that you can place your novices in there. And if, that way if you bump them, they don't go flying. So yeah, that was the only thing I found I didn't like about this game. You know, that's one, uh, I can say a thousand good things about this game and only one bad thing. That's pretty good odds. And that's why this game is number two on my 2021 list, Monasterium by R.D. Fueler. And this is by DLP Games. Yeah. Oh, man, I can't wait to play this game again. It is phenomenal. Man, that's a good game. All right. Now for number one, and this is like the second year in a row that this company has a number one game. For me, I think Calico was 20, and number one this year is going to be Cascadia. It was a tough decision between this and Monasterium. And what pushed this game up to the front is it's a little more approachable as a board game for people that don't play board games. And I like that, and I always reward that when a designer can make a game that is great for experienced board gamers 
and approachable for people that do, do not play board games a lot. And that's why Calico of 2020 was my number one game. And you know, what can I say? Cascadia is number one this year by Randy Flynn and illustrated by Beth Sobel. She does a lot of board game art, wingspan, and the one I just, Doc, uh, Steve Finn's whatnot cabinet that I just showed you. This is by AEG and Flat Out Games. I, and this is a Kickstarter. And these people deliver on time. Uh, Calico delivered earlier on time. This delivered earlier on time. And I don't know. Well, I don't know what their secret is, but they've got this game figured out, uh, this Kickstarter thing. And they deliver. And if you see a, I think they've got one or just had one called Verdant. Is it over that. with? No, we, yeah, we backed that one. Too. Yeah, we back, we backed that game because, I mean, they, they deliver. So uh, I'm not, uh, I don't think I'm gambling when I go on Kickstarter and I black, back something by Flat Out Games and AEG. It, I mean, they delivered on to people. Uh, there's people that have bad games on Kickstarter. They're waiting two, three, four years, and sometimes never get their game. So you have to be careful. That's why I, that's why I try to talk about Kickstarter and try to help you along if you've never heard of Kickstarter so that if you get out there, you you won't lose your money. But this game, Cascadia, is wonderful. It plays one to four players, 30 to 45 minutes. Oh my gosh, that's magnificent. It's where we like to play. And it is simply a game where you have some animal goal cards that you're going to be trying to complete the patterns of. And you make a selection of pairs where you have a tile and an animal disc. And those, you take the pair and you're going to place them in your tableau trying to complete a scoring mechanism for that particular animal. The animals themselves, it's, it's tailored to what the animal would really be like. So like an eagle, he has to have his line of sight to score certain tiles. I think an elk or whatever is in a herd and things like that. So they, they use that animal theme and made it very, very important in the way that you score these patterns for this game and it's just so much fun it's a very very tight puzzle and the scores are always very very close which is another thing I, I love when a designer can do this and that's Randy Flynn man thanks a lot for a great game this is number one for 2021 you guys you can pick this game up read the rule book and play it and that's why it's number one you know Monastery it's, you're going to study that rule book a while before you play that game, and, and, and it's a wonderful game. It's number two, but I always give the edge to a game that is, is good for the largest number of gamers out there. This type of game is great for board gaming industry. It's great to grow the board gaming hobby, and that's why it's number one, ladies and gentlemen. That's Cascadia, and that's my list for 2021. I know it's a long video. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for giving me thumbs up on when you take that extra effort to do that and like our videos it moves up in the lineup when people are searching for games or when they're searching for videos and gets us up there so that our videos can be seen you know I don't get any money for any of this that I do all these games we present to you Lori and I are games that we've purchased and searched out uh, we've looked and watched uh, playthroughs and videos and and played the games ourselves and try to bring them to you because they're great board games we don't make a penny we bought all these games and we just want to share our passion with you. Thank you for watching. I love every one of you. Have a great day and a great time. And remember, remember, remember to keep on board gaming. It's the best hobby on the planet. I'm not kidding you. Bye-bye.